At times you're in a gothic world filled with decadent banquets, labyrinthine gardens, and sinister conspiracies. And at other times you're in a fabulous fairy world full of animate objects, morphing monsters, and thieves who steal memories. Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Wendy Walker's novel, The Secret Service. This was originally published in 1992 by Sun and Moon Press, but was recently republished by Tough Poets Press in 2020, and that's the edition that I have here. This book was very generously given to me by George Salas, who runs the Kaleidoscope, who wrote about it in his Invisible Book series, and he offered to send me this copy, this signed copy, by the way, which is very, very nice. Um, this book that I knew nothing about, he reached out and offered to send it to me uh, and asked that I would just review it. And man, am I glad that he reached out and that I accepted. I feel like such a fool for not knowing that this book existed until just a few weeks ago. And I'll just say up front that this book is amazing. It's criminally neglected. The 1990s were a pretty good decade for literature, from William Gass, David Foster Wallace, Don DeLillo, Donna Tart, Evan Dara, etc. But I've now come to realize that any list like that is wholly incomplete without having uh, Wendy Walker on that list. This novel has everything that I love in a book, a unique and just gorgeous writing style and voice. Here it's beautifully Baroque, a part historical, part fabulous setting, a fantastical, literally a uh, fantastical atmosphere reminiscent of medieval fairy stories, an encyclopedic mode that is bordering on maximalism, that explores everything from the history of botany to theater costume design, a plot that involves deceptions, illusions, conspiracy, espionage, and just stories inside stories inside stories, all of which come together to create a novel that is just mesmerizing in the very literal sense of that word. Conceptually, this is a novel that should not work, but it does. It works so damn well. So what is this book about? It takes place sometime in the 18th century, somewhere in Europe. The general setting is uh, quite exact, but the details of that setting um, are a bit more inexact, which is good because it allows Wendy Walker to um, explore this time period and this, and this region rather than be restricted by it, which often happens, in my opinion, in a lot of historical novels. Let me just read the first opening uh, few sentences of this book, because it really sets the stage. And all stage metaphors are uh, should be taken very seriously. This novel is very interested in theater. It's always interested in performance and the underlying um, illusions and deceptions that all performances have. Anyways, the opening is just great. I am a mousseline goblet, upside down, set aside to dry, the banquet done. Some daggletail scrub girl has cleansed me. I am also the lacy middenette, binding the bouquet for the courtly gentleman come to purchase camellias before the party at my aunt's flower shop. I count the change. He glances at my petticoat, ready to turn me upside down and ring me like a bell. When I first read this, I thought, wow, that's a lovely metaphor. Our character, Polly, is like a goblet, used up after a banquet and set aside to dry, only to be used up again the next night. But this is not a metaphor. Well, it's not just a metaphor. Anyways, Polly is literally a goblet. Our main protagonist is a cup. See, she is part of the English Secret Service, in service to um, His Majesty the King, of course. And she and the other members of the English Secret Service have figured out a way to transform themselves into inanimate objects so they can spy on the Crown's enemies. And the Crown does have a lot of enemies. In fact, the conspiracy that they're investigating in this book is quite serious. I won't explain all of it, I'll try to be as brief as possible. But let me just set it up as Walker does in the first few pages of this novel. There are three main conspirators who have plotted for years and years to overthrow the, the, the royal family, to destroy the royal family. It involves swapping two babies, royal incest, etc. It's a whole detailed plan. But the three conspirators at the beginning of this novel are attending a banquet. They are Baron Schelling, Cardinal Aminati, and Duke Del Cere. And their diversity is quite important, as I'm sure you can tell just by their names. They are 
German, Italian, and French, respectively. But they also have quite different social positions, as you can probably tell by their titles. But they put aside their differences, and they're working together against a common enemy to overthrow the English crown by means of public scandal. And the English Secret Service know that something is afoot, though they don't know the exact details of the conspiracy. So they decide to spy on them at this banquet. And these three conspirators are meeting for just a, a banquet. But of course, it's not just a banquet. Polly explains, I also am a spy, a counter agent, utterly unthought of, unanticipated, undiscovered by the Emperor's researchers in intelligence. Beneath the glittering feast, the main intent is war. The Baron knows it, and the other men. Though the Countess and her like are quite naive, they come for the waltzes, and the glimpses of foreign ladies and their jewels, the decorations of the gallant gentlemen's in monocles, wide sashes off the shoulders to the waist, and epaulets, the capes and canes and exotically accented speech. All this courtesy and glamour is pageant for the eye, but the subject matter's war. And I just love Walker's writing style, the alliterations, the Baroque diction, etc. Anyways, this is where Polly and the Secret Service really come in. They're spying on this banquet, and they have the best view in the room. They are on the table. Polly is a mousseline goblet sitting on the table. The corporal, one of the leaders of this contingent of the Secret Service, came up with this idea to become the machine of minds. What would the Duke desire most that he did not possess? The Cardinal? The Baron? At the banquet, the Corporal would set it before their eyes, within reach, where they could caress it, covet it. The object would haunt them later. So all the members of the Secret Service have chosen specific objects to transform into based on what they know that the conspirators will like. Polly is a goblet because she knows that the Baron is very interested in uh, porcelain and glassware. So she knows that the Baron will always keep her close. Another one of the Secret Service, um, a, a, a young man named Rutherford, changes into a rose because he knows that one of the other conspirators is very interested in gardening. And this focus on objects is really interesting because there's a, an intense focus on objects uh, and material things throughout this entire book. We get all of these luscious and encyclopedic descriptions of all sorts of different objects, which pull the narrative into these very long uh, and detailed anecdotes, again, as varied as the, the history of architecture to um, uh, taxonomy of plants and flowers in a garden. Like any good still life painting, take as an example, the painting that is, adorns the cover of this book, Breakfast of Crabs by Willem Clates Haida. Each detailed object in the painting has a life of its own. That is, the objects described in this novel literally and metaphorically come to life as they're all bursting with originality, personality, and character. They're their own characters, as fully wrought and realized as any of the human characters. I mean, some of the objects literally are humans. And by this point, you're probably wondering how the English Secret Service are able to transform their human bodies into these objects. And it's a fair question. And the answer lies in very detailed pseudoscience, drawing on various theories going back to Aristotle's On the Heavens, as well as various theories in physics. And there are actually a couple of different essays within this novel that explain all of this over the course of a dozen or so pages. I won't explain it in detail here, um, but you can read about it in, in, in the book. It's, it's not just a, a sort of whimsical gimmick of the book. It's explained at length. But what makes the transformation ability so interesting is that, again, it doesn't come across as a gimmick. It's fully realized and fully ingrained into the world of this novel. When Polly is a goblet, she views the world as a goblet. When Rutherford is a rose, he experiences reality through the lens of a rose. And there are all these just wonderful and highly original passages throughout this book of how these characters are experiencing reality in their object form. When Polly is a goblet, she can see the entire room in a 360 degree arc. The whole room and the green views out of all four windows that pierced it revealed itself in a miraculous simultaneity. A human view would have imposed some definite limit 
or junction, but Polly saw everything that there was to see over a boundless horizon in every direction, above and below. All objects, though exceptionally fine in outline and strangely luminous, as if a film of the purest water ran between herself and them, nevertheless warped in a peculiar horizontal distension that made them seem like the squat shapes of midday shadows, though highly colored and vivid. And these passages are some of just the most original passages in this entire book, and this book is not lacking uh, in, the, in the realm of originality. But because of all of this, this novel has a very fabulous atmosphere. The world of the Secret Service is full of illusions and deception. It's never clear if you're looking at an object or if you're looking at a distorted reflection of that object in a mirror. And this brings me to one of my favorite aspects of this book, which is the fabulous or fantastic mode in which this book operates, which reminds me very much of some of my favorite authors. Borges, Calvino, Shion, Rushdie. And comparisons to these four authors in particular I think are very apt and I think someone could make some really interesting connections between these authors. But Walker is also drawing on medieval literature and I know I connect everything to medieval literature but it is very clear and very explicit that Walker is drawing on the medieval tradition. Walker is clearly a medievalist in her own right. The next book of hers that I'm definitely going to read is this short story collection called Stories Out of Omery in which she retells many of the lays of Marie de France, who is one of my favorite medieval poets. But speaking of medieval literature and how uh, Walker allows medieval literature to influence this book, one of my favorite sections of this book is this very long, I think it's about 100 pages, this very long central chapter right in the center of this book. And I won't spoil anything here, but one of our characters goes on this quest to this other world, this other realm, where reality becomes quite surreal. They go on essentially a quest that explicitly at times mirrors the quest for the Holy Grail told in so many different uh, medieval romances. But it also reads like one of the lays of Marie de France. And there are all of these specific, I think, uh, direct allusions to some of the lays, most specifically Guillemar and Yannick. But Walker is clearly drawing more generally on the idea of this other world or this fairy world that so many uh, medieval stories and especially Marie de France explores so much in her lays as well as medieval travel narratives like John Mandeville's travels um, to the Far East where they go and the further away they get from Europe reality becomes more and more skewed becomes more and more just surreal and strange. And I talked about it a little bit in my video on Blood Meridian, as well as my video on Umberto Eco's Badalino. But the other world that our characters go to in The Secret Service is this city of ore, which is just filled with animate objects who talk, thieves who steal all sorts of specific objects, but they also steal dreams and memories and time. In this section, there is a sort of Kafka-esque quality to it as our characters are kind of pulled along in this trance-like state where they don't really understand what's happening to them. But at other times it has this surreal quality as reality is bending, as it's full of tantalizing tricks and hypnotic illusion. This novel moves into a full-blown fantasy world reminiscent of uh, Shadesmar in Brandon Sanderson's The Stormlight Archive, of all things, as it's full of humanoid creatures and sentient objects that one would only expect to find in a, in a fantasy world or maybe in your dreams. But the effect that this has in this novel is one of an illusory hall of mirrors. And speaking of illusions, this novel is just full of them, as Walker's descriptions of objects literally dazzle the reader. She's very interested in these ideas of deception and illusion and performance. Nothing is quite like what it seems. There's always something just beneath the surface, and usually there's something just beneath that surface as well. And there are stories within stories. There's a clear homage to the mousetrap play in Hamlet, as we witness alongside one of our characters this full-blown play. Walker is always playing with the reader's perception of reality, as much as the characters within the story are also playing with other characters' perceptions of reality through their own deceptions and their own espionage of other people's deceptions. There's a wonderful Flaubert quote uh, that's included in this book that I think informs a lot of what this book is doing, which is, of all lies, art is the least untrue. This novel is full of artful artifice. And like George says in his review on his website, 
Don't let the seemingly ordinariness of the cover and the title of this novel fool you. Open this book and find yourself transported to a new world, and then transported to another one, and one more after that, all of which are anything but ordinary. This novel reads like an espionage novel because, well, it is one, but it's also so much more than that. At times you're in a gothic world filled with decadent banquets, labyrinthine gardens, and sinister conspiracies, and at other times you're in a fabulous fairy world full of animate objects, morphing monsters, and thieves who steal memories. And throughout the entire journey it's just full of decorative, baroque, and gorgeous prose that dances and dazzles. There's an anecdote on Walker's website where she talks about um, kind of where this book came from, which is she would read all of these novels and she would keep a list of interesting words as she read, and then she would look them all up on the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, and then she would force herself to write a story using all of those words. And this sort of storytelling game is uh, replicated in this novel as some of our characters at one, in one section of this book rhapsodize a communal story as they take turns building the story out of nothing. But the linguistic acrobatics throughout this novel are just hypnotic to read. I can't praise the prose style and the, the narrative voice in this novel enough. You just have to experience it for yourself. This is my favorite kind of book because it's a book that demands and rewards very, very close reading. It also demands to be reread, as I'm sure a reread would uncover more and more secrets that I'm very, very eager to find. So I barely even talked about the plot. Let me assure you that there is a very intricate plot that drives this narrative as, as lies are uncovered and truths are exposed. But I thought I would leave that for you to discover. This novel is just wonderful. I can't recommend it enough. It's a terribly neglected novel that deserves a much wider reading audience. This deserves, in my opinion, to be on your shelf full of all of those other maximalist books of the 1990s. And one more thanks to George Salas for sending me this signed copy. I really appreciate it. And if you want to read more about The Secret Service um, or about Wendy Walker, I'll leave links to George's uh, review and his interview with Walker uh, on the Kaleidoscope in the description below. But for now, thanks for watching.